So to start off with this Kubernetes 101, you're going to need to create a Kubernetes cluster. And to do that today, we're going to use GKE, the uh, Google Kubernetes engine from Google Cloud Platform. And to get that going, we're going to start by going to the Google Cloud console. And you can get that at console.cloud.google.com. If you need to go through the process of signing up for an account, uh, go ahead and walk yourself through that. Uh, it's pretty uh, straightforward, and Google gives you quite a bit of free credits when you first start out. So uh, you should be able to run this for, for free in its entirety. But if you start by going to the, uh, the hamburger in the upper left-hand corner, uh, drop down, and you can scroll down and see Kubernetes Engine. And we're going to want to click on Clusters. Uh, you'll see it come up, and you can see that I don't have any clusters created right now, so I'm going to start by clicking Create Cluster. So it brings up a menu of a bunch of different options that you can choose. Uh, for us, the defaults are mostly OK. Uh, in this case, because we are working on some free credits that Google has given us, we want to minimize our costs. So on the left-hand side, you're going to click on Your First Cluster. And then down at the bottom, you'll see a blue button, and you're going to go ahead and click Create. If you want to mess around and, and look at advanced options, you can certainly do that. As you start to get more advanced in administration of Kubernetes, some of this stuff will be a lot more meaningful to you. Uh, but for our purposes today, we're just going to use the, um, uh, just use the defaults. So we go ahead and click Create. And you'll see kind of over here towards the, the center left of the screen, you'll see sort of a spinning bar. Um, and uh, that, is, that is the process of your cluster creating. Uh, it's important to remember that there's a lot that Google does for you behind the scenes when you create a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, if you've ever created one from scratch, you'll know exactly how much goes into it. Uh, so uh, it'll take just a minute for all of that to come up. So now that that's complete, uh, it should have taken you know, somewhere between three to five minutes uh, in order for your cluster to come up. And what you'll see is you'll see a green check mark right here as well as the name of your cluster. Uh, typically, if you just use the default settings from the previous screen, it will tell you, it, uh, Google will name your cluster for you. In this case, it has named mine your first cluster dash one. So once your cluster is up and running, there's two ways to verify that you can connect to it. Probably the easiest way is to use the Google Cloud Console. If you click on the Connect button over, over to the right, you'll see two things. You'll see uh, a place where you can, uh, you can copy a G Cloud command. And this, this operates under a few assumptions, is that you have the G Cloud command line utility installed, as well as you have uh, the cube control utility installed. Uh, if you don't have either of those installed, or you want to just get started a little bit quicker, you can see this blue button right here that says Run in Cloud Shell. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And what that's going to do is that's going to bring a cloud console up uh, just in your browser. So if you scroll up, uh, you should see that it, uh, that it brought up the cloud console. And it auto-populated here with the, with the command that we're going to need in order to pull down the authentication file for our Kubernetes cluster. So if we just go ahead and run that command, just hit Enter. And it, it, it is run. And so we can run a few quick uh, kube control commands to verify that we can actually connect to our cluster. So the first one that we'll run is kubectl uh, config get con uh, current context, I'm sorry. And if we run that, what that should do is that should echo back the, co the current context that we have for connecting to a Kubernetes cluster. In the real world, you might have you know, any number of clusters that you're connecting to uh, at the same time. And you can use the kubectl config command in order to switch context between cluster. Be very, be very careful if you're running this in like a uh, production. Um, we are switching back and forth between production and, um, and like a development cluster. Because you could be, have your current context pointing at production, and you mean to run something in development development, and uh, things, could, uh, things could go poorly from there. So be sure to use the, the kubectl config current context command pretty liberally. So you can see that we're connected to the uh, Kubernetes cluster that we just created. And we can verify that that Kubernetes cluster actually has uh, space to work on if we run kubectl git nodes. And we'll talk a little bit more about what some of this stuff means as we get further into the 101, uh, you know, what the meaning of nodes is, uh, how to find out more information about nodes, that sort of thing. But we, uh, we can see right now that we have GKE, your first cluster, dash one, dash pool one, and then a hash to signify the name of the node. So we can see that we have a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we are indeed talking to it. And we can go ahead and continue on with the rest of this workshop.
um, the rest of this one-on-one and uh, be able to work, in, uh, work against our Kubernetes cluster. All right, well, that's it for creating your first cluster. You're now up and running. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about some of the history of Kubernetes and some primitives that you can uh, expect to need to know in order to continue on and actually start deploying something to your cluster. For the second part of our Kube 101, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the history of Kubernetes and the value proposition that it offers uh, to people thinking about adopting it as a technology that you may run uh, for personal projects or within your business. To start, we'll talk a little bit about what is Kubernetes. And by definition from the Kubernetes community, Kubernetes is an open source system for automating deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications. How did Kubernetes come about? In 2015, Google introduced the Borg system, which is something that they had been running internally since about 2004, and started off as a small project with only two or three people working on it. And uh, what it was was it was a large-scale cluster management and resource scheduling system that introduced some of the following concepts. Admission control, so what sort of work do we allow to be scheduled in our cluster? Uh, introduced the concept of uh, smart bin packing. So how do we get many systems, many processes uh, run on a single node in a way that they're not going to be able to interfere with one another? It introduced process level isolation of resources. So if you schedule a Docker container or many Docker containers on a single node, how are you going to be able to ensure that uh, the process uh, requirements and needs of those don't interfere, interfere with the process requirements from a, from a different process? And it made all of this declarative. So effectively, you were able to take uh, the workloads that you needed to schedule, uh, define them very clearly in, say, like a YAML file, and you were able to submit those to an API, and the API I would tell you if it was able to schedule the work or not. So how was Kubernetes introduced to the community as, a, as we know it today? In 2014, Google introduced Kube as an open source version of the Borg system. Uh, in 2015, shortly thereafter, uh, you saw the v1.0 of Kubernetes released. Google joined with the Linux Foundation to, for, to form the CNCF, or Cloud Native Computing Foundation. The first ever Kubernetes convention, KubeCon, uh, was, was hosted, and they started the, a quarterly release cycle of Kubernetes. Now that all that is out and people have started to adopt Kubernetes, what sort of problems does it solve? Users expect applications and services to be able to uh, be up and available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And when you work with a container orchestration system like Kubernetes, where you're able to schedule work, you can take processes and schedule them across many machines, um, you know, many different times. And what that, what that allows you to do is that lose a node or lose an individual process and still not see a disruption in the uptime of your service. Kubernetes offers smart ways and schemes for, be, for to deploy applications. Devs expect to be able to deploy code multiple times a day with no downtime. And if you're a systems operator, they want you to give them the opportunity to do, do that. And Kubernetes allows you to do that because it allows you to have smart ways of doing things like rolling updates to be able to allow devs to deploy at any time without having downtime. Companies desire more efficient use of cloud resources. We talked a little bit ago about what uh, Kubernetes offers in the way of bin packing. So rather than having a single process running on a single cloud node that you're having to pay for 24 seven, what if you had you know, an ability to schedule many processes on a single cloud node? And what if you had the ability for your cloud nodes to recognize when am I not able to schedule new processes and when do I need to bring up more resources and when do I have things idle and I'm able to spin that down? Kubernetes offers very easy ways to be able to toggle those sorts of, uh, that sort of elasticity. Kubernetes is fault tolerant and self-healing infrastructure, which provides reliability. Like I mentioned a minute ago, what if, a, uh, what if one of your container processes goes down, or what if an entire node goes down? You're gonna need those resources to come back eventually, or you're gonna need that single process that went away to be rescheduled somewhere else on a node that isn't, comp that isn't down. So uh, Kubernetes gives you the ability to do that. Kubernetes also offers automated horizontal scaling in the node and container pod scope. So that means that Kubernetes will allow you to uh, bring up new nodes, automatically add them to your cluster if you need further resources, or if a single service is feeling resource constrained, Kubernetes has the ability to detect that and bring up new instances of that service in order to handle the additional load. For the next part of our Kubernetes 101, we're going to talk a little bit about Kubernetes architecture basics. So in Kubernetes, you have two primary types of machines, 
involved. You have masters and workers. And effectively, you'll hear both of these called nodes, but most oftentimes when you hear people refer to a Kubernetes node, they're talking about a worker. Purposes of the masters is they do a few things. They serve the Kubernetes API. So anytime you issue a kube control command, you're talking directly to one of the masters. Typically, masters are run in odd number sets uh, in order to maintain quorum, so you can lose one and you're not going to have any downtime in the API. Uh, the masters also hold state for the workers. So uh, remember we talked about previously that Kubernetes offers a declarative way for you to submit work to an API, and it will tell you if it has the ability to schedule it or not. So when you, when you declare new work, and that work either gets scheduled or doesn't, that state gets held with the masters. It manages scheduling of workloads, like we just mentioned, and it's often referred to as the control plane. Uh, like we're doing with some of our stuff today, where we're using GKE, which is a fully managed service, you'll hear people talk about uh, the managed control plane. And that really just means that there's a uh, managed service that is offered, uh, that Kubernetes has offered. And so as a administrator, you don't actually have to administer the control plane. You're just responsible for managing the nodes that sit behind it. On the other hand, workers are where, uh, where most, of, most of the stuff gets done. Workers are what you'll interact with the most. Uh, so workers run, um, run work that's sch they're scheduled by the masters. Uh, they can be grouped into subgroup, typically called pools. So you may want to run many different kinds of workloads that may have different resource requirements. And so you would create different node pools that meet those resource requirements or are better typed for the type of work that you're looking to do. And nodes also have readable properties that you can access through the API. So as you're scheduling work, you may want to schedule work on a, uh, a node that has a specific operating system or is a specific cloud instance type. And you can read that information from the API. So you can get OS distro and version, you can get resource allocation, and you can even get things like region if you're running a multi-regional cluster in the cloud. So here's a simplified Kubernetes architecture diagram borrowed from a Datadog blog that was explaining Kubernetes architecture. In the center here, you can see that the uh, you can see the Kubernetes logo, and that signifies the control plane, like we talked about just a minute ago. Uh, typically, if you're using a managed service like GKE, that control plane is managed for you by the service. And you can see here that, you know, like we mentioned earlier, uh, the API runs in the control plane. So typically, this is what you'd be talking to when you issue kube control commands. And you can see that as, as those commands come in and you submit work to the API, it schedules them on various nodes. In this diagram, we have two nodes. We have node A and node B. Each node is running the kubelet, which is a daemon that runs, a uh, daemon process that runs on the node and talks back up to the masters to tell it things like, this is, this is the amount of resources that I have available in order to schedule work, and what work is pending, and can I take that work from you and actually schedule it uh, on the node that I'm managing. And then you can see we have representations of a few pods. We'll talk a little bit more uh, when we talk about Kubernetes primitives about pods, but pods are effectively groups of containers that get scheduled on a node, containers being Docker containers. When a pod gets scheduled, you can see that here on node A, we have two different pods. In the first pod, we have three different containers inside the pod. The second one, we have two, and or we have one, I'm sorry. And on the uh, node B, we have two different containers inside of the pod. When you submit work to the Kubernetes API, it takes you know, these groupings of containers called pods, and it will take them and it will distribute them across any number of nodes that might be in, in your cluster. For the next part of our Kubernetes 101, we're going to talk a little bit about Kubernetes primitives, or really just some vocabulary and concepts that will be helpful to know when you actually start working against the Kubernetes API. So really, Kubernetes is organized into a series of objects that you do your typical CRUD operations, right? Create, read, update, and delete through the API. Kubernetes declarations, they're compromised of a series of interrelated objects. The API provides extra functionality with higher level abstractions of these objects, which we'll cover in more detail in just a little bit when we talk about uh, one of the more primitive objects in an abstraction. And declarations of these objects are typically stored in uh, YAML format. Um, and you can use that to uh, put into version control, or you can just store them on your laptop. And you take those, those YAML files and submit them up to the API.
So the first primitive that we'll talk about is we'll talk about the pod. We briefly touched this in the, uh, during our architecture segment, but effectively what a pod is, is it's a set of one or more containers that's scheduled on the same physical or virtual machine and act as a unit. So when you're creating a declaration of a pod, you could have uh, the definition of any number of containers that lives inside of that pod. And when we get a little bit more into our, uh, the hands-on portion of our workshop, we'll be able to dig into some YAML and see exactly uh, what the specification looks like for how you define pods um, uh, in a pod spec. The other interesting part about a pod is it shares, uh, they share a network internally. So there's a private network that gets shared whenever you schedule a pod among all the containers inside of the pod. And they can also share uh, uh, file system uh, um, volumes. If you're familiar with Docker and you've th used things like volumes from, where you're uh, able to actually use things like data volumes or just share storage space between containers, it's the same concept in Kubernetes when you're running multiple containers inside of a pod. You can, you can share ephemeral or copy on write style storage uh, um, from within the pod. Second primitive we'll talk about is labels. Uh, every Kubernetes object gives you the opportunity to attach uh, metadata through labels, which is a series of key value pairs that you are able to, uh, uh, that can be mostly arbitrary and mostly useful to a user in order to attach information to that object that is relevant. Typically these are identifying attributes that are, are most useful to the users making declarations. Uh, labels inherently don't imply semantics to the core system, which means that you know, there's no functionality that you are going to get uh, out of labels explicitly that is important to the Kubernetes core system. Uh, labels are interrelated with other objects, and we'll get to that when we talk about selectors in just a moment. So they're very important. They can be used to uh, orchestrate, attach, and identify uh, different objects within the Kubernetes system. They can be attached to an object via create or update operation. So when you create a pod, for, an, for example, you can uh, have labels that are attached at that point. Or you can have a pod that's already out and running, and you can say, I want to attach this bit of metadata to it. And you can do that through an update. Labels are not unique, and they're not expected to be unique. The expectation, you know, like we talked about earlier, where you can have many instances of a process running across many different nodes, the expectation would be that those all have identical labels because they're all the same process. On the right-hand side of the screen, you can see a little snippet of what labels might look like inside the context of a Kubernetes YAML definition. Uh, on line 10, you can see that we declare labels. And we have three labels that we're applying to this. The app that we're running in this case is Redis. Uh, the role is primary uh, in, in the case of like an HA Redis implementation. And the tier is back end, right? So because Redis is a stateful service, so you may have like a web front end. And that would be the tier labeled there. And uh, this is the back end. Again, you can, you can uh, designate labels to be anything that you want in any sort of semantics that makes sense to you, because these are, these are yours to be able to orchestrate different things within the Kubernetes system and apply metadata and identifiers the way that you see fit. Uh, on the other side of labels are selectors. Uh, selectors give you the ability to take Kubernetes objects and say that this object interrelates with a different object that you previously applied labels to. So selectors will identify a set of objects through filtering. Um, and th that set of objects that it identifies and filters by are objects that have the relevant labels. And uh, it's important to remember that empty label selectors will match all labels. So for example, if you look at uh, the snippet that we have on the right-hand side, you can see line 14 is where we designate that we're going to have a list of selectors. And on line 15, you can see uh, that the, the app key has a value of Redis. And so that says that the object that we're defining here needs to be able to filter out and find everything that has a label with the app key and the value of Redis. Now, if we were to take on line 15 and just remove the Redis string, then we would, then we would be able to match with our filter everything that has the app key with any value in it. So the next primitive that we'll talk about are deployments. We talked a little, about, a little bit at the beginning of this section about how Kubernetes provides objects, and then it provides layers of abstraction on top of those objects in order to help you organize many of them. And in this case, a deployment is an abstraction to the, um, to the pod. 
And what a deployment does is it allows you to uh, have extra functionality and control on top of a pod to say, I want to run maybe six instances of this pod across many machines, and I want to have a rolling update, update strategy to say, you know, only roll one pod at a time, so one of my processes at a single time, I have six of them, and maybe wait 30 seconds in between, so you can roll through and really be able to control how you're doing your deployments and, uh, you know, what the requirements that you have are in order to have zero downtime as you're bringing up new versions of a process and deprecating old ones. So deployments, like we mentioned, they're higher level abstractions of a pod. They define a group of identical pods. We talked a little bit when we were talking about labels about how you may have many processes, many instances of a pod running across many machines, and the expectation is that they're going to all be identical in, uh, in all facets. Pods can, or, uh, deployments can scale replicas of a pod to meet demands. We talked a little bit about horizontal scaling in a previous section. And what that does is it gives you the opportunity to set resource limits on uh, individual pods across all of the identical pods that you're spinning up with a deployment. And what that'll do is that when a pod starts to consume that, num that amount of resources, it will say, do I have a number of replicas that I'm below, right? So if my max replicas is 15, for example, and I'm only running 10, and I start to get resources constrained, Kubernetes knows enough to say, hey, I have space for another five of these pods. I'm going to go ahead and spend them up because I'm resource constrained. Deployments are responsible for create, update, and delete of a sequence of pods. So if you delete a deployment, all the corresponding pods are going to go away. And if you update a deployment, all the corresponding pods are going to be updated. And you can control that in the definition of the deployment with things like uh, rolling update strategies. And then deployments can roll forward and roll back. So you can effectively take your, uh, your deployment definition, the declarations that we were talking about earlier, and uh, change exactly what version of your containers running inside of your pod that you want to run. And it can use that same rolling update strategy to either roll forward or roll back to a different version. Getting outside of the context of just uh, containers and metadata, we'll talk a little bit about uh, services, which is another uh, very, very key uh, primitive for Kubernetes. So a service is effectively a network construct that defines a consistent way to access pods that might be running. So if you submit a deployment to the Kubernetes API and that deployment spins up five different pods, you're going to need, and it's a web service, for example, you're going to need a way to access all, all of those pods, right? And you're going to need a way to do so uh, in, uh, with a method that allows you to do things like round robin load balancing, for example. So you're going to want each request to go through your sequence of five pods and each, he, hit each one of them individually. So in order to do that, we use a service. And you can see a snippet on the right that, that is the YAML definition of a service. And let's review some of the previous things that we've talked about, like labels and selectors. So a service, just like everything else, is a Kubernetes object. And you can see on line four that uh, we have a metadata section. And uh, the name of our service is web app. Uh, we have labels attached to it with a key of app and a value of web app. And then if we go down, we see on line 15 that we have a selector as well. And the selector for this is a key of app and, again, a value of web app. And what that does is it says to this service, it says, hey, every pod that I have running with a label of app and a value of web app is relevant to me. And so when I'm, when I'm firing up and I'm trying to create paths in order to get network traffic to pods, a web app pod that might be, uh, that might be serving my web application, uh, what I need to do is I need to send traffic to each one of those pods that I find relevant. And if you have five running, and we talked about the fault tolerance of Kubernetes and how it helps you provide things like zero downtime deploy and more reliability in your applications and services. If, uh, if you have five pods running that are relevant to the service and one goes away and you have four left, then the service knows, hey, that pod is no longer there or no longer healthy. I need to be able to uh, only route traffic to the remaining four until another one comes up. Same thing with the idea of, the, of horizontal auto scaling. If you have 10 pods running that are resource constrained and that spins up to 15, it's the service's responsibility to understand there's now 15 pods running and I need to be able to distribute traffic to all of those so that way you can use some of the newly allocated resources and you're no longer resource constrained across your entire application. The function that services provide is they provide within the cluster a way to load balance between pods. And services can also talk to external cloud uh, resources 
uh, talk to external cloud providers and uh, spin up uh, cloud resources, uh, such as cloud load balancers, ALBs, ELBs, those sorts of things. So uh, that's one really, really interesting way that Kubernetes really is cloud native as a platform. There's lots of functionality built into the system to be able to integrate with whatever cloud provider you might be working on. Kubernetes certainly can be run on premise if you want to run it in a data center, but there are lots of extra features that you get if you run it inside of Google Cloud Platform or AWS, for example. With services, there's four types, and these are important because we'll look at these when we start to do some hands-on work here in a moment. Um, the first type of service is cluster IP. This is probably the most common service that you'll see. And what uh, a cluster IP service does is it exposes a service uh, to a cluster on an internal IP. Typically, those are used for things that are services that only need to be accessed by other things running in the cluster. And Redis is a good example. You would never want your Redis data store to be accessible from the public internet to read, read to and write things from. You would only want it accessible from other things running inside of your cluster. So you would assign a cluster IP service to uh, a Redis implementation that you had also running in your Kubernetes cluster. The second is a node port service. What node port does is it exposes a service on the IP of the virtual machine uh, on a static port. So if you have a, um, a pod, say, uh, running on three machines in a five node cluster, if you have a deployment and the deployment spins up pods running on uh, three machines in, say, like a five node cluster, for example, and uh, you assigned a node port service to that, it would statically map a port on those virtual machines to directly to the pods running on those virtual machines, and it would be accessible from the IP uh, not assigned to the pod, but to the IPs assigned to the actual nodes that they're running on. And there's a lot of reasons that this might be useful if you're running things like daemon sets and you have log aggregators or you have monitoring systems that need to be available. You would typically use a node port service. You do have to be careful, however, because if you are assigning static ports on an individual node, uh, you need to be aware of port collisions. And if another pod that is identified by that same service get scheduled on the same node, you're going to end up with failures because it's not going to be able to, to actually allocate the port to it because it's a static port on the node. The next type of service is a load balancer service. And I talked just a minute ago about uh, one of the uh, cool, very cloud native parts of Kubernetes, which is that it can actually talk to external cloud providers and provision cloud resources for you automatically, again, through the declarations that you provide in Kubernetes YAML definitions. And that's what a load balancer service is. So a load balancer service effectively exposes the service externally using a cloud provider's load balancer. So so in GCP, you have cloud load balancers. In AWS, you have ALBs and ELBs. And what you can do is, in your service definition, you can say, give me a load balancer type, and it will actually spin up an ELB for you. And it will handle all the networking under the covers and allow you to have access from that ELB um, that may be integrated with your, with your uh, uh, DNS. And you can talk directly to your pods that may be serving your web app that way. The last type of service is an external name service. And what this does is it actually maps the, uh, the service that you have running into your cluster um, to an external DNS provider and will uh, assign a CNAME record uh, to those IPs. Somewhat similar to what, uh, what it does with load balancers, but it actually has some, some interaction directly with, uh, um, with a DNS provider. For the hands-on portion of this workshop, we're going to look at deploying a multi-tier web application with Kubernetes. And in order to do that, we've prepared a GitHub repository that you can clone, and it has all the Kubernetes manifests that we're going to need in order to go through deploying a web application. If you go to github.com slash reactiveops slash kates workshop, you can clone this repository. You can use the git clone command uh, here in the slide, or we'll walk through going through there and navigating to that GitHub uh, project and actually getting it cloned. So if you go out to your browser and you go to github.com slash reactiveops slash Kate's workshop, go to the clone or download button and go ahead and copy that URL and then move over your terminal window and do git clone and the URL that we just copied. And it's a relatively small project, so it pulls down pretty quickly. And let's take a quick spin and just see what's available in the root of this project. 
So we drill down into Kate's workshop and we see that there's a README available. There's an assembly required folder, a complete folder, uh, an images folder, and an Istio folder. For the purposes of this, we are going to ignore all of those except for the, uh, the README and the complete folders. Uh, if you go through the README, there's two tracks that you can follow along here. Uh, we're going to go with the most basic track for the purpose of this video, but if you find yourself going through the basic track and you want to get more familiar with digging into problems that could arise when you deploy an application to Kubernetes, uh, go back and look at the assembly required uh, version of this, and effectively what that does for you is it provides uh, a little more nuance to the Kubernetes YAML that will put you in some stickier situations and allow you to get in and really do some debugging and test your ability to run kube control commands and gain some understanding of what might be going wrong with your deployment. We will drill down CD into the complete folder. And uh, during this time, as we go through this, we can refer back to the readme, which is also made available in nice format on the GitHub page. We'll go drill down here into complete as well. And we'll look at the README here. So uh, once in the README, uh, we will um, run our first kube control command. And what, that, what, we do, what we do here is we're going to create a namespace. So the first step that we're going to take is we're going to provision a namespace. And a namespace is a way to segment and uh, bucket objects that you're provisioning in the Kubernetes API. So let's take a quick look and open our namespaces.yaml file and uh, uh, sort of get a feel for what the definition of this object looks like before we apply it. So if you uh, use your text editor, and open up uh, namespace.yml, we'll see that we have um, an API version, the type of object that we're going to provision. So, you know, we've talked about services, we've talked about pods and deployments. Anytime that you create a YAML specification, uh, you, you have a kind in there, and that says what kind of object the API should expect to be defined right below it. Under that, on lines three and four, we have metadata, and we have the name of the namespace that we're going to create. We'll go ahead and close out of that. And uh, let's just take inventory on the namespaces that we have in our cluster by default. And then when we provision a new namespace, we'll be able to ensure that the namespace that's defined in our YAML was provisioned. So if we do kube control git namespaces, we can see that it comes back and there's three namespaces that are provisioned in a Kubernetes cluster by default. There's the default namespace, the kube public namespace, and the kube system namespace. So we're going to create a third, which we just saw as Kate's workshop. So if we do kube control, apply, dash F, and the dash F flag signifies that you're going to pass a file to kube control for it to submit to the Kubernetes API. And we will do namespaces.yaml, and we hit enter, and we can see that it came back and it says namespace Kate's workshop created. So if we uh, up arrow a few times and we run the same kube control git namespaces command and it comes back and we can see here uh, the second one down that 13 seconds ago we created the Kate's workshop namespace. So effectively as we move forward, that's how we're going to be applying and submitting objects to the Kubernetes API is all in YAML definition and we're going to use the kube control uh, command line tool to uh, take those files, parse them, and submit them up to the API. So cool. So now that we have our namespace created, we're going to go ahead and deploy the first tier of our multi-tier web application. And uh, that first tier is going to be Redis. So we're going to start with our stateful backend in order to uh, um, store, store state for the web application that we're going to be provisioning. One really neat thing that, that Kube Control uh, allows you to do is it allows you to take a series of YAML files, uh, put them in a folder, and you can just run apply-f against uh, an entire folder. And it will provision all of the resources, all of the objects defined underneath that folder in a way that is uh, in a sequence that allows them to effectively uh, bring up the things that have the proper labels first, bring up the things that have uh, selectors after that, and allow those objects to join and interconnect the way that you've defined across many number of YAML files. Effectively, what this does is this allows you to create a grouping of objects and many YAML files and not have a single YAML file defining everything that's uh, a thousand lines long. But before we do that, let's again sort of take a spin through what we're about to apply. So we'll go ahead and we'll roll out the back 
back-end tier of this multi-tier web application. And for us today, that's going to be an HA Redis implementation. If you list out the contents of the 01 underscore Redis directory, uh, you can see that we have a sequence of files under here. We have the deployment file, which we talked about earlier when we were talking about primitives. This will define a number of pods that get spun up. Uh, you have a service file, and this is effectively going to define a cluster IP service, like we talked about earlier again, because we don't want to have Redis exposed to the public internet. We only want it exposed to other things running in our cluster. This is a, uh, an HA Redis inst uh, implementation, so we have a deployment file for our replica. Uh, we have a horizontal pod autoscaler for our replica. So again, we talked a little bit earlier about how you can attach resource limits to your deployments, and you can say when you know, resources get constrained, go ahead and provision new, uh, um, new pods as part of this deployment in order to uh, give me more resources to work with so I'm not so constrained. The horizontal pod autoscaler is what does that. We have a, a service available for the replica, so the master can talk down to the replica. And then we have a, a network policy for Redis. Let's just crack open one of these files and, and take a look at what the, what the definitions look like. In your text editor, if you um, open up the Redis-primary deployment file, you can see again, uh, we have an API version that we're going to talk to. We have a kind. The previous kind when we deployed our namespace was namespace. So this is just where you designate what sort of object you're going to be submitting to the API. We have metadata. Uh, again, a name, uh, a name for this deployment the namespace that we want to provision this into, because we don't want to just provision it into any namespace. We created a specific namespace for our Redis deployment. So we're going to deploy it into the Kate's Workshop namespace. And then we have a specification for what we want our deployment to look like. In this case, we have, uh, we're going to provision one replica. So that means that one pod is going to be part of this deployment. And then we are going to template out the spec that we want this deployment to have. So uh, we have some labels applied here on lines 11, 12, and 13. And then here is where we define a sequence, starting on line 15 is where we define a sequence of containers. We talked about earlier, pods are really groupings of containers that operate as a union. So here we only have one container that we're going to, that we're going to spin up. Uh, the name of the container is Redis. Uh, we're going to pull from the Google Container Registry. We have uh, some resource requests that we're going to attach to that. So we're going to say that when you spin up this container, that uh, we want to allocate 100 CPU shares and 100 megs of memory to it. And then we have some, some networking bits built into here, too. So effectively, we're saying, hey, when you spin up this container, uh, on the container, expose port 6379, which is Redis's default. Just to give you an idea of what a, a deployment would look like that maybe has um, uh, maybe wanting to spin up more than one pod, we will look at the, um, uh, the Redis replica deployment really quickly. And you can see here that we still have only one replica. But if we move over in our text editor and we actually look at the Redis replica horizontal pod autoscaler we, um, uh, definition, we can see that we have a minimum replicas of one, which is what the deployment requires. And then we have a max replicas of five, which means that under resource constraint, you may see the number of replicas of your Redis, um, uh, of, of your Redis replicas go from anywhere from one all the way up to five. We have a target reference. So we're saying that you know, the, de the deployment this pertains to is Redis replica. And the way that we're going to do horizontal scaling is we're going to do it on CPU. And we're going to say, if the allocated CPU reaches 20% utilization, then we want the horizontal pod autoscaler to bring up other pods. So you can feel free to dig around in these YAML definitions a little bit more. For now, we're going to go ahead and apply them to our cluster and get this HA Redis implementation up and running. So again, we will do a kubectl apply dash f. And like I said, you can apply an entire folder directory full of Kubernetes specifications all in one shot. So we'll just go ahead and do the apply dash F against the entire 01 underscore Redis. Kube control apply dash F to say that we're submitting a file or a group of files. And we're going to run that against our entire 01 underscore Redis directory. And so if we go ahead and hit enter, 
you can see what it did is it went through all of the uh, files that we were looking at just a minute ago inside that directory and it created objects for each one of them. So you can see that we have a Redis primary deployment was the first thing to get uh, created. Um, we have a Redis primary service. We have a Redis replica deployment. We have the horizontal pod autoscaler for your Redis replicas. We have the Redis replica service and we have a network policy that got created. So now what we're going to look at, you know, we've just deployed all of these objects to Kubernetes. How do we read those and be able to get some data about what's actually running? If we run kube ctl, and in this case, we're going to specify our namespace because we're not actually submitting YAML in this case. We're just doing read operations. We're not doing creates or updates. So we're going to want to specify our namespace. Otherwise, by default, Kubernetes looks in the default namespace. If we don't specify our namespace, we can do kube control get pods, and we can see that there's no resources found. But if we do kube control dash in Kate's workshop and then get pods running, we can see that we have two pods running. If you remember when we actually looked at those deployment files, we saw a number of replicas. And the number of replicas was one for our Redis primary and one for the replica. And we can see that we have each one of those there. And if we do the same thing on the pod abstraction of deployment, we can say kubectl n for namespace, Kate's workshop. get deployments. And again, you can see that we have uh, some information about our, our deployments here. We have Redis primary, Redis replica. We have a desired count of one, current one, up to date. So like, say if you're doing a rolling deploy or something, you may see some more interesting information here about the state of an application that says maybe has many containers out there, or a state of a deployment that has many con uh, pods out there, and you're rolling through and you're uh, doing some sort of rolling update. Um, we can see the number that are available, and which means that they're ready to take traffic, and we can see that there's, a, there's an age on those. So it's been one minute since, the, since uh, that object was provisioned. Um, and then let's take a look at services, too, while we're poking around. So we'll do kubectl, again, dash in, Kate's workshop, and we will do git services. And so here, we can see that we have two services, just like we, we were looking at when we were uh, kind of sifting through those YAMLs inside that directory. We have a Redis primary and a Redis replica. Back in the previous section when we talked about types of services, uh, again, both of these services are cluster IP services. So they're only going to be available on an IP that's internal to the cluster. Those IPs are, are listed here. So again, it's in the 10 dot range, typically a range that would fall within a CIDR block that's for a private network. There is no external IP assigned to these, again, because they're cluster IP services, and some information about ports that they're listening on. So that's the back end, uh, uh, back end tier of the web application that we're going to deploy. So let's go ahead and move along with deploying the front end tier. So uh, if we look and we do a listing of the O2 web app directory, we can see that it has uh, uh, similar, um, similar objects in there, similar files, right? Uh, we have a deployment is the second one down. We have a horizontal pod autoscaler, a network policy, a service, and there's two new, there's two new uh, object types that we have in here in config map and a secret. So let's take a moment to look at the config map really quickly and see how config maps are effectively ways to source in environment variables and static files into your pod Play, uh, play into the role of a deployment. So if you use your text editor and you open up um, one of the files under O2 web app, like app config, config map.yaml, we'll see that uh, what we're doing is we're providing uh, a hierarchical sequence in keys that you're able to drill down into and then in a value there. What we have is we have this data section starting on line five, and under that we have app dependency.url, we have a URL string there, and we have app dependency dot requires TLS and a value of true X. So if we want to see how that relates to uh, what we're about to deploy in terms of a deployment, we can open up the deployment spec. We can move on down to, to line 57. 
And effectively on line 57, what, what we're saying is under here on line 40, where it says we're going to define a sequence of environment var variables that are going to get injected into the containers of our pod and, or into our container at runtime. You can see that there's, there's a sequence of others, but on line 52 and line 57, you can see that we're referencing this config map object. So a config map is a way to effectively take what you're doing for configuration, whether it be files or environment variables, store them off in their own object, and store that once, and have many pods as they scale horizontally read from the same thing you know, via uh, how you build out and how you define your deployments. So on line 52, you can see that uh, we're taking the environment variable dependency URL, and we're going to populate that with a value from uh, a reference to our config map key. Uh, our config map is um, the web app config map, and the key is app.dependency.url, which we just saw in the previous file, and a similar way of defining uh, dependency require TLS, which you see here on line 57, and uh, that gets sourced in from the web app config map and the app.dependency.require underscore uh, TLS value that we looked at just a minute ago. Let's go ahead and get this stuff applied, and then we can kind of take a poke around and see what these objects look like when they're stored inside of Kubernetes. So we will do kubectl apply-f 0 to web app and again we're going to apply, go ahead and apply this entire directory of YAML manifests. Cool. And just like when we deployed Redis we can see that it went through the sequence of files inside the directory and deployed all of them. Let's go ahead and uh, let's take a look at that config map that we created and that we're referencing from our deployment. If we do kubectl uh, dash n, Kate's workshop, get config maps. That's interesting. We see that there's no config maps. And so here's an instance where potentially maybe we missed a parameter when we were applying things. We know that we are looking at the default namespace uh, currently by default. And you know we're specifying the Kate's workshop namespace every time that we deploy something, um, or it, you know we try to read information back. So potentially maybe this uh, this O2 web app uh, implementation got deployed into the default namespace. So let's do a kubectl um, uh, and not specify the namespace parameter and do git config maps. Okay, and we see that we have the web app config map in there. So what happened is that we deployed all of our resources into the wrong namespace. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to back out that apply that we just did, and we're going to need to rerun the apply and specify the namespace. And the reason for that is, is if you look at the 01 Redis, Redis primary deployment, uh, you can see here on line five that we specified a namespace. And if you look at the same deployment for web app, you can see under metadata that we, uh, we haven't uh, actually supplied a namespace. So let's go ahead and back out our, the last apply that we did. And we can do kubectl delete. And we do dash f, just like we do with the deploy, because we're going we're gonna to do a sequence of files. And we do it against the O2 web app directory. And so we can see that it went through just like it did when it created, and it deleted all the resources defined by the manifests that live underneath that directory. OK, so now that we know that we need to uh, reapply our front end here in the proper namespace, we're going to go ahead and do that. So we're going to do kubectl uh, dash n, Kate's workshop, again, uh, setting the name flag, uh, 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 the namespace flag on the command line, uh, Kate's workshop apply dash f the o2 web app directory and we can see again just like when we built out redis our back end here that all these got all, um, all of these objects got created so if we go to kubectl dash n kate's workshop and we get services we can see that we have a load balancer uh, service of web app pending and what we'll expect to see, if we give it a few more minutes, Now that we've uh, applied our web app, we have the front end tier um, of this multi-tier application up and running. Uh, let's take a look at the services available and see how we might actually access this web app. So if we do kubectl 
uh, dash in for the namespace, uh, Kate's dash workshop. We'll do git services. We can see that we have a third service available now. Uh, we have uh, both services attached to Redis, uh, which are cluster IP services, again, only accessible from within the cluster. And then our third service, which is our web app, is going to be exposed publicly because it's a load balancer type service. And you can see that when we list services, it provides us an external IP uh, that we're able to hit. So if we go and copy that external IP and come over to our browser, and put it in, in the browser, you can see that our, um, uh, that our web application is serving hello from Kubernetes. Simple web app, uh, basically hello world application. And so how do we know that uh, our Kubernetes application, that this specific pod and a container in, inside that pod is actually getting traffic? And for this case, let's look at a very useful Kubernetes command, which will allow you to, to live tail logs coming from a specific container. So in order to do that, we're going to have to get the name of the actual pod running. And if we do kubectl dash n, Kate's workshop, get pods, we can see that we have one web app pod running. So we're going to go ahead and copy the full name of that pod. And we're going to do kubectl dash n, Kate's workshop, logs dash f. Again, just like you would if you were live tailing logs in Linux, you're going to use the dash, f, the dash f to follow the log, and we'll go ahead and hit enter. So we can see here that we're getting a bunch of what look to be health check requests, and that's exactly what they are. They're internal health check requests to make sure that this pod is actually live. But if we go back over to our browser here and we refresh this a couple of times, we go back over, we can see the different Git requests against the base URL coming through. And so we know that from the public, public internet, we actually have access to our web app running in our Kubernetes cluster. So there you have it, um, a, a method for deploying a multi-tier web application into Kubernetes. This is really just the tip of the iceberg, and there's many ways that you can orchestrate workloads and applications in Kubernetes, but hopefully this is enough to get you started. Thank you.